I'm Mathieu from Ludovox, and today we are in the Watsu Game booth. Uh, inside the Watsu Game booth uh, at Essen Spielmesse with Aaron Haag. Hi, Aaron. Hi. Nice to meet you. Likewise. So, you are the designer of uh, the latest entry in um, the Watsu Game brand, and it's Loot Island. Yes. Loot Island is um, a, a bit of an unusual game for um, What's Your Game because it's not such a heavyweight, big box game. It's a smaller, smaller box and an easier to play game. It's not a necessarily a, a family game because it has some challenges, but it's not the usual kind of um, What's Your Game game. And you can play it uh, from two players up to five players, right? That is correct. It's two to five players, um, and it takes about 30 minutes to 60 minutes, depending on the number of players. So what's the goal of the game? Who are we as, as players, as characters? Right. Um, we are actually uh, treasure hunters. We have um, pieces of map, of a map, of, of a treasure map. These are these cards. And uh, we have a treasure island where we are looking for treasures which were buried by um, pirates several hundred years ago. Now, the important thing is that the island is cursed. So uh, all the treasures we are finding will have curses as well. That is why the pirates actually um, uh, uh, did hide their treasures on, the, on this island. Um, we're using these, these map cards to, um, to uh, build a line of cards on, on the landings of, uh, in total, eight landings here. And um, when there are sufficient cards, depending on the number of players, it's the number of players plus one, we will find treasures. And as I said, these treasures are cursed. Here we have some treasures. And um, they also all have a value. These are coins, a bag of coins, which has a value of uh, five uh, gold coins. These are jewels, which have a value of four. But they also come with curses. And when we take the treasure, we also have to take the number of curses that are put on there. But we are not allowed to have too many curses because then we are, self, uh, we are uh, cursed ourselves. So whoever has 13 curses or more at the end of the, uh, of the game uh, is out of the game. So it does not score any of, of the treasures uh, found. So you have to take a careful balance of taking valuable uh, curse, uh, treasures and uh, not getting too many curses. Yeah? That's why if you take a, a treasure you also take the curse, but you can say, I don't take the treasure, I, I uh, keep it hidden in the island, then you are allowed to give away two of your curses instead. This is the balance you have to take between curses and, and treasures. We have several different kinds of treasures, in total six. Some are sets, for example, the jewels, you get extra points if you have two jewels or three jewels. Um, some are uh, majority oriented so if you have the most of uh, some of the treasures you get extra points for, for those. So can you give me an overview of what we do in a player turn? Each player has at the beginning of the game and at the beginning of every round seven cards, hand cards and when it's your turn you have uh, three options. You can either play cards of a single color uh, to one of these landings. Yeah. Um, when you do so, you take one of your tokens, your compass tokens, to signal that you have placed cards there. You are participating in that treasure hunt uh, at that landing. Um, it's important that you only you are only allowed to use one landing. So when you, when it's your turn, you place cards at one landing. You place cards of only one color, and they must be in ascending order, not necessarily without gaps. So it could be seven, ten instead of seven, eight, like we have here, but they need to be in ascending order. 
And what are those stars? Are they uh, wild cards? These are wild cards, a star. Uh, oh, these are, unfortunately, yeah. I can play a star here, a green star here. And that's not a nine. <laughs> and you don't have a choice. It's the value of the previous card. So that's an eight. So you can play an, uh, an additional eight. There are uh, two, tw uh, twice, uh, uh, two cards with the same number of each color. So there are two eights, and that could be then an eight. That is an eight, and another eight can be played there as well. Okay. Um, other question. So uh, when does the game end? Do we have a, s uh, a set of rounds? We have a, s a fixed number of rounds. Um, for each round, we have a, um, a special event card that helps us in uh, tracking the number of rounds we've played. And the event cards are just slight, very slight rule changes which are applicable to all players. So it doesn't favor a particular player, but it affects all players um, in an equal way. So for every round, we we flip a card, and then once that round is, round is finished, we take the card, and the next one is flipped. After five rounds, the game ends. Um, I said that one option is to play cards here. We also have small islands. These are here. These allows you to play also cards of the same color. You need to play two cards of the same color on one of the small islands, and then you can use the special ability of that uh, island. You flip it, and for that round, nobody else can use that ability. So this one was losing two curses, taking a treasure, and discard, and, uh, and taking a curse, uh, moving your uh, token. Not necessarily moving, but you, as I said before, you can um, only place your token when you place a card, at least one card. You can place as many as you will. Here you can place your token without playing a card. So if you see there is a row which will probably get a lot of treasures, you may want to use that action to place your your token there. Uh, drawing two cards, uh, moving the ship. So what is the ship? The ship, the ship means this. Wherever the ship points to, this is the. These are the two rows which are actually, or the two landings which are actually evaluated at the end of uh, at the end of the round, once all players have passed. Okay. Passing is the third option where a player has. Once all pl players have passed, we evaluate the length, which is, as I said, in a four-player game, it would be a minimum of five cards. And then we evaluate how many treasures are uh, uh, revealed, and then players start to select. How many treasures are re uh, revealed is actually important because there are big loots and small loots. The row of cards, which is the longer one, is the big loot. The big loot means you always get uh, one treasure for each of the tokens plus one treasure for each of the um, cards which has a, a, a chest, a treasure chest. Unfortunately, ah, no, here we have one. They not all <laughs> have treasure chests. <laughs> um, right, um, the small loot, only the treasure chests count. So it can happen that the small loot actually yields no treasures at all. So what happens here, for example, in this example, uh, in, let's take this, as a, this example. Um, we have to add another card. We have five cards for a four-player game. That would yield, um, if there are no cards here, uh, it would s yield six treasures. Four here, plus the two here. So you, uh, you reveal six treasures. And then, and that is why it is important to have these, these tokens there. You select the treasures in the sequence of, of, of this stack starting at the bottom. So blue takes a treasure, red takes a treasure, and so on. Here, you can, if you take that action, red could, for example, say, but I'm at the bottom. You move your token to the bottom of the stack. OK, so um, what are those characters here? Do, do they stock curses? Um, no, they don't stop t uh, curses. At the beginning of the game, you select one of these c characters and this is the color you're playing. So we have blue, yellow, red, black and white. And you start, every player starts off with three curses. Yeah? Um, I have questions about you as a designer. Um, so why design games and specifically management games? Like Union uh, that I played was a management game. This is kind of a management game. 
It's not a race game, it's not an adventure game. Why a design game and why design uh, management games? Okay, designing games, why do I design games? I've been a, a player of board games since nearly 30 years now. And when I retired a few years ago, I said, now I have the time to actually design a game. Uh, and the game I want to design is something which um, is very interactive. In, or in, let's say um, your action is affecting the other players to a certain degree and it's not this 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 anal analysis paralysis thing um, where and you have some influence of, of uh, to what the other players are doing so you have to on the one hand uh, you can do things which they don't like and you can prevent uh, things that, um, other players may want to do to to hurt you so this is what I mean by, by having a, a interaction between the players. So you don't build something for your own and try to be the best. This is to me more like working with an Excel sheet and find, finding a good business case <laughs> with an Excel sheet. Um, you don't need other players. Uh, I like this kind of, of interaction and de interdependency between the, be between the players. So I, I thought, okay, I, now I have the time. Let's let's start with designing a game. I have so played so many hundreds of games so I should know how to do it and I can tell you it is a very good very difficult task to, to design a game which actually works in the end and people like. So um, I assume that you've played countless different games. Uh, do you have a few favorites uh, that lasted over the years or something that you've seen this year in the recent years that you really liked and digged? Um, yeah, my favorite game is actually 1830 by Avalon Hill, or Lookout uh, re-released it um, about four years ago, I think, four or five years ago. Um, this is a management game. It's uh, a bit of a cutthroat uh, financial stock dealing game, and um, I like that very much. On the other hand, there is a very light game, which we often play as um, a game at the end of an evening when everybody is tired, and that is a Bluff, or the English version is uh, Liar's Dice. Yeah? That is also very, very interactive, and that's why I like these kinds of games. Uh, recent years, I must admit, um, I'm playing less and less because I'm more concentrating now on, on designing games and um, as you can imagine you have hundreds of playtest sessions with, with your games and I burden my players in the area of, I'm coming from Munich, in the area of Munich by bringing my prototypes and say hey can we play this? <laughs> Which they often don't like so much because they say, but we have, we've had Essen and we have 50 new games, can we play these? But so I have to concentrate on playing my own games. So uh, why go to a, an Italian publisher and not a German publisher? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I never... Um, actually, the story behind this game is uh, when I had designed it. It had, a, it had a different theme. It was not a pirate theme. It was a... Um, uh, it was called... Originally, it was called Diggers, and it was uh, dwarves digging for jewels. Um, but the, the basic concept was, was the same. Um, and... Um, when I had it finished, from my point of view finished, there was a lot of work I did together with the, with the uh, publisher. Uh, I thought, hey, this is something which fits exactly in the range of uh, what's your game? And people said, hey, it doesn't fit at all. Look at Madeira and all the heavy other uh, games. And I said, but look at Oddville. They have also this, this small line of simpler games. And when I talked to Mariano, he said, ah, oh, yes, that could be interesting. And you found it interesting in the end, and we we had a had a contract. That that, that was a perfect match. So <laughs> good analysis on your part. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron, for that overview of Loot Island, for your presentation as an author, and see you on Loot Box. Bye bye. Yeah.